the Titans have hosted 13 prospects on top 30 visits that we know of. We're going to go through each of these prospects. Who are they? What round will they likely be drafted in? What are the Titans telling us about their draft plans with these visits? This is the Music City Audible. Let's get to it. Oh, welcome everyone to another episode of the Music City Audible podcast presented by Broadway Sports Media in partnership with 440 Sports. I'm Justin Graver. With me, as always, Justin Mello. And Justin, today we're going to talk through all 13 top 30 visits that we know about for the Titans as of this recording on Tuesday morning, April 9th. There are 13 reported top 30 visits for the Titans. We're going to go through every single player, tell you a little bit about each of them, what you need to know about them as prospects and where they are likely to be drafted. And then at the end, Justin, I think we'll go through this list and kind of figure out what the Titans plans might be positionally, where in the draft they're targeting certain positions based on what we can glean from these visits. Disclaimer off the top. I think it should be noted the Titans did not host, at least it was never reported, the Titans did not host Peter Skaronsky for a top 30 visit. Still drafted him in the first round. So while we have this list of names and we think, you know, some of their draft picks are going to be off this list, not necessarily all of them, maybe none of them will be. So just a quick disclaimer. Justin, how's it going? Doing well. Excited, man. We're in the thick of draft season, as you said. We've got a bunch of uh, you know film breakdowns on the YouTube page people can check out. Some of these prospects, I believe, or at least one or two of them on that list of uh, film breakdowns we completed. And uh, excited to go through these names. There's some good players here. Titans are showing interest in. Yeah, and before we really get into this episode, let me remind everyone to check out Sinker's Beverages in East Nashville and Bluegrass Beverages in Hendersonville, our sponsors for this episode. And go to the sinkersbeverages.com website or check the link in this episode description to join the in-crowd. In-crowd members get access to allocated wines and spirits, exclusive events, early access to barrel releases, and more. So check that out if you have a second And Justin, before we really get into this, you just mentioned our our film breakdowns we've been doing. Make sure you're subscribed to the YouTube channel so you never miss a video as soon as it drops. But I think we should tell the people we're likely done with film breakdowns for now. I think after the draft, when the Titans have a draft class, we'll do a film breakdown on every prospect that we can get film on. And we definitely will get back to those. But for now, I think we're going to focus more about overview of the draft, talking big picture items and not going so heavy into film reviews of one prospect at a time. Right. And I'm looking forward to, you know, kind of focusing on the players they actually draft. So once we got a draft class, don't worry, people, the film breakdowns will return. We'll do a couple of them for sure, at least on the first round pick, second round pick, third round pick, if they trade back, yada, yada. Uh, Really looking forward. When we know those guys are Titans, really looking forward to diving into them. I think there's a good chance that anyway, of the four that we already did, um, you know, pretty decent chance Titans first round pick is on that list. I fully agree with that. And and we will talk about three of those guys that we've done film breakdowns on as we get into the top 30 visits. So let's do it, Justin. We are going to go through these visits in the order that they were reported, not in the order of who's going to be drafted first and who's going to be drafted last, but the, the chronological order we heard about these visits. And I want to make a quick note about these visits because I haven't pushed back on Twitter, but I almost have. I've seen lots of people, analysts in my field saying, oh, these don't matter as much as you think they do. Um, a lot of times it's to do a re a medical check. Well, number one, that sounds like it matters, right? <laughs> number one. And number two, um, 260 players get drafted roughly. Okay. You figure um, what another 300 get signed as undrafted free agents. I think saying about 10 players per UDFA class around the league, right? So you're talking about 500 total players in any given draft class, a bit more than that, 550, 600 actually. Okay. You get to bring 30 of them in for pre-draft visits, 30. You don't think teams are very careful with which 30 players they choose to bring in yeah. and build a relationship with? I did one with a Michigan corner the other day, Mike Sainer still, who's a really good prospect, really like him. He talked about visiting the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. And I can say this because I'll have broken that news by the time this podcast comes out. He talked about visiting Tampa Bay Buccaneers and talked to me about how it was an amazing, he felt like family. It felt like the first time he visited the Michigan campus when he was a recruit. Okay, you don't think that matters? Go back and read my Romeo Dubs interview from a couple years ago when no one cared or knew who he was as a prospect, and he told me he had a great visit with the Green Bay Packers. Yeah. Okay, like these visits, they mat 30 of them. Okay, even if they're doing them for a comp- medical check. And I, and I feel comfortable including the UDFA group in that crop because some teams will use visits on a couple UDFAs that they want to target. 
So again, when they're yeah. looking at the whole class of 500 prospects, and a lot of times they do target some UDFAs, they get to bring 30 of them. Of course, they, they don't pick names out of a hat. Okay, They yeah. matter. Absolutely, they matter. And I did give that disclaimer about Skaronsky, but that isn't to say that they don't matter. I think you know we right. can no, read into course. these too much. I've just seen so much of that yeah. on my Twitter timeline lately. Well, I do think there's a balance because there is a, a point where you're reading too much into the visits and you're only mocking players to a team that have confirmed sure. visits. Keep in mind, we will probably half the visits, maybe a third of the visits, we won't even hear about. They'll never get reported. Yeah. Nobody will ever yeah. tell anybody. Teams are sometimes more tight-lipped with prospects than others because they don't want it to get out that they have interest in somebody. So they specifically tell this prospect and their agent, like, please don't share that you were here. And other times, teams don't care as much. Maybe they want it to get out. Maybe they want it to look like a smokescreen. So anyway, with all that said, let's get into it. In the order that they were reported, this one reported by our very own Justin Mello, Missouri cornerback Chris Abrams Drain was the first that we knew of to visit the Titans he is a uh, cornerback who can play in a variety of coverages, played outside at Missouri. He was a first-team All-SEC cornerback this past season, led the team with four interceptions, 13 pass breakups, 51 tackles, two and a half for a loss, started all 13 games. He's got great ball skills. I may have said that already. Um, he does have a slight frame, smaller frame, kind of reminds me a little bit, not as crazy, but a little bit of Emmanuel Forbes, who was a first round pick last year, who had a, a pretty slight frame. Um, but I think, you know, he's a guy that could make an impact at the next level. Projected to be a fourth round pick. Justin, what do you think about the fit with Chris Abrams drain in Tennessee? Yeah, I think fourth round pick is probably safe to assume. Roughly, I will say the note about the frame, it is slight. He's not quite as lanky as Emmanuel Forbes. Like I had a bigger concern on Forbes because Forbes was so tall and so slight. Yeah. This guy's versatile. He played a little inside and outside. I thought he played really well uh, at the senior bowl as well. He's extremely combative, right, at, that, at, at the catch point. I think that's one of the things that really interests and excites them about him. 40 career pass breakups at Missouri. Yeah. That's a lot of ball production now. And seven interceptions, as you said, for this past season – three, a couple of years ago, I thought their interest in him was interesting. And I'm going to say, I'm going to repeat myself in a few minutes when you get to another player on this list, but yeah, inside outside versatility. I don't know that that frame holds outside so well, you know what I mean? Like he strikes me as more of a nickel corner, I think at the next mm -hmm. level, but the ball production is outstanding. You certainly, uh, I'm sure there are some teams that think he can play outside and Titans might be one of those teams, so you appreciate the versatility. Another interesting note here that I think uh, a lot of people would probably gloss over is uh, 29 career kick returns. Scored a touchdown in mm. 2021 off a kickoff return. But that was a 100-yard return, by the way. Took that one right out of the end zone all the way back. Wow. 29 career kickoff returns, 603 yards, one touchdown, about 21 yards per return. So with these new kickoff rules, you know that'll obviously be interesting to see how teams uh, target a guy like him. But definitely, uh, I think, a really, really good slept-on football player. And I mean, I said it already, but I'm going to reinforce it and point it out again. First team, all SEC. This isn't first team, all Mountain West or whatever. This is, you know, the best of the best, the biggest colleges, the Alabama, LSU, Georgia. And he went to Missouri, who had one of the best defenses in the call in college football last year. We when we talked about the uh, we did a film breakdown recently, talked about how this Missouri defense held Ohio State to three points in the Cotton Bowl. Like this is this was a no doubter defense, and he was a big part of it. So, and do you think? Do you agree with the uh, the fourth round projection there? If the Titans were to target this guy, obviously they don't have a third round pick. Is he a guy that's going to be off the board by the time they're picking in the fourth round, or do you think he's still there? I could see him being a late third. Like I think that late third to mid fourth range. I, I don't. I'd be surprised if he makes it to round five or later. I just think the production is too good. The senior bowl was too good. The versatility, the special teams. I don't think he's a second rounder, but I do think he's like a late third, early fourth. Yeah, I mean, that makes sense. All right, the and next everyone, guy on this by list. The way, no, everyone on that Missouri defense is getting drafted, it feels like, right? Like Darius Robinson, the other corner opposite uh, this kid was uh, Ennis Rakestraw Jr., who I think has got a chance to be a first round pick. You got uh, the linebacker is going to get drafted as well. Tyron a a Hopper, who was at the senior bowl. So crazy talented defense. Yeah, and he was a big part of that, like I said. So, all right, next guy on the list, very similar, very similar prospect, cornerback Jarvis Brownlee Jr. out of Louisville. You also reported this visit with the Titans. Uh, a little background on Brownlee. He started at Florida State. Uh, he had 15 starts in two years at Florida State, seven pass breakups, three interceptions, transferred to Louisville after those first two years, 
at Louisville over the last two seasons. He had three interceptions, 21 pass breakups, three and a half tackles for loss. Now he, like Chris Abrams drain projects more probably to be a, a nickel defender at the next level. But what I love about his game is he is physical, he's competitive, he's feisty. He fits really well in that Denard Wilson mold that we've already seen the Titans target in free agency would fit really well in the secondary next to guys like Jadobe Awuzie and Legereus Sneed, who are extremely physical corners. Roger McCreary in that mold as well. He's a guy that's like a press cover. He's going to rough you up at the line of scrimmage. Now, that does lead to some big plays. He can get burned deep uh, at times because of his aggression. He's a little over-aggressive sometimes. Um, but he's a guy that, you know, you, you can coach up in that way. He's got decent speed. He's not a superior athlete, but he's a, a good enough athlete. And he was a standout at the Senior Bowl as well. He had an interception in the Senior Bowl game as in addition to standing out in practices. Um, what do you like about Jarvis Brownlee Jr.? Well, I'm trying really hard not to repeat myself, like I said. Yeah, because like I, I said, see, very if similar anything, prospect. And this is something to note, though. If anything, I think it gives us a pretty good indication of what types of cornerbacks they like, right? Because, okay, Absolutely. how many boxes does he check are exactly the same as what I just said? Inside, outside versatility, like Chris Abrams' drain. Good ball production, like Chris Abrams' drain. Extremely feisty, scrappy, and competitive at the catch point, like Chris Abrams' drain. Also, I think a bit on the smaller side. Like, it's not a guy mm -hmm. that I see making a full-time living on the boundary at the next level. I think there's some nickel in his future. But uh, I, what I take away from this mostly is I look at those two players, and it's almost like the Spider-Man meme for me, you know, where one's pointing at <laughs> the other because see a lot of similarities between the two of them. Uh, again, I think it gives us a really good indication of the types of cornerbacks this regime might like. And, you know, these two guys would both – probably be better fits at the nickel at the next level they can maybe survive on the outside but not like you said not full time so interesting what the titans may be targeting here obviously you have three good starting cornerbacks you know roger mccreary could survive on the outside if you had to move him are they looking for that depth spot that can play nickel that might be able to play outside or you put him nickel and mccreary goes outside like they need a pretty solid cornerback four because injuries are an unfortunate reality of the NFL. McCreary's missed some time. Awuzie's missed some time. Sneed didn't miss time, but has been dealing with this knee issue, swelling or whatever that he says he knows how to manage. But obviously they want some insurance there at that position. I think, you know, fourth round of the draft is the place to find it potentially. It is Brownlee, I've seen Brownlee also projected in the fourth round, fifth round, day three kind of guy. You think he's a guy that'll still be there on the on the board when they pick in the fourth? I'm I'm thinking same range. I'm thinking like late round, mid fourth kind of guy. And I like what you said because it's a good range to get a player like that. I don't like what they have at corner four right now. You know, like a Trey yeah. Avery, Eric Darer. I, I don't know that you want one of those guys starting. And you're essentially one injury away from one of those guys starting because you know nickels the new base as we always say. So. Uh, curious to see, and I'm also wondering, in truth, were some of these meetings scheduled or did these visits take place before the luxurious need trade? You know, I mean, maybe mm. it's not as important to them anymore. I mean, that's a possibility. A lot of these would have happened uh, in, in mid to March, probably. So, uh, but interesting to note nonetheless. Yeah, absolutely. All right, let's move on to the next guy on our list here. McKinley Jackson, defensive tackle out of Texas A&M. Six foot two, 324 pound monster in the middle. Was a two-time captain at Texas A&M. He's, uh, you know, like I said, six two, low center of gravity, a bit shorter. But I think in today's day and age, after Aaron Donald transformed the defensive tackle position, we've seen guys that can play well from a, with a shorter frame because they get lower and they have better leverage. Um, he was used a lot as a nose tackle at Texas A&M, and I think slightly miscast there as a nose tackle. Had had some trouble two-gapping and eating up space like that, but good penetrator, a guy that can make stops in the run game, not as great as a, as a pass rusher, doesn't use his hands very well, he can get his hands knocked down quickly and, and easily by offensive lineman that could have to do with the fact that he has shorter arms but productive player 27 tackles in 12 games last year including five and a half tackles for loss three sacks a forced fumble a fumble recovery you know you'd like to see maybe a little bit better tackles for loss numbers from a guy who was playing nose tackle there but like i said may have been slightly miscast um does have a little incident in his background was suspended for two games in 2021 after getting arrested on drug charges so 
have some explaining to do when he visits the Titans, but um, not not the worst thing to have in your background. Another guy projected early day three, fourth round type of guy. Well, I really like this guy. I'm going to be honest with you. I think I like him more than you. Um, I don't think he's getting enough attention throughout this pre-draft process. I do think the sack numbers, the TFLs, I think they'd be better if he wasn't miscast as a nose. I think he's a better uh, pass rusher than he is run stopper. That's just my opinion mm. on film. Uh, I, I don't think Texas, and a- Texas A&M put him in the best positions to showcase the full range of his capabilities. I wouldn't be shocked if this guy ends up being a really, really good football player. I wouldn't be stunned if we look back and say, damn, we slept on that guy. That guy was good and should have been drafted higher. I got like a late second round, early third round grade oh, wow. on him. That's how high. He was dominant at the senior bowl at times. Like really, really good. Like one-on-one reps. Not a lot of interior linemen could keep up with him in those reps. And again, I, we all, I always say those are kind of slanted towards the D linemen. It's, it's sort of unfair, uh, those old linemen, those one-on-one pass rushing drills. But really, really good football player. I'm extremely intrigued by it. Uh, uh, noticing a theme here coming out of this list as we go through it, and the next two guys also fit this list, all have been at the Senior Bowl. First three guys we talked about, all at the Senior Bowl. Next two and, guys. You know who wasn't and, at the Senior Bowl? And Ryan remember. Carthon. Wait, was Ryan was, there? Uh, Exactly what I was about to say. I don't, Ka- Carthon and Callahan, <laughs> neither of them were there. Right, that's what I thought. <laughs> yeah, they were so, busy, I think, working on, I don't know if it was like a, the, I think it was a, assistant coaching hires. They had so many right. coaching spots to fill. They stayed back home in Nashville and did interviews and hires and all that. I think uh, Anthony Robinson and, uh, was there, I think, at the Senior Bowl, but and a couple of scouts, of course. But no Carthon, no Callahan. That's a good point on your part because it might be the first time they're so, getting to see these guys, meet with them in person. So they probably watched the tape from the Senior Bowl practices, obviously right. from the game, and they said, who do we want to bring in here from this that we didn't get a chance to talk to there and identified some guys. And the next guy being running back Marshawn Lloyd out of USC, he uh, started his career at the other USC, South Carolina, played there for three years. Uh, well, he missed his, his freshman season with a torn ACL and then played at South Carolina for two years after that. Transferred to USC for 2023. He was honorable mention for all Pac-12. He uh, ranked seventh in all of FBS football with 7.1 yards per carry. Totaled 116 carries for 820 yards and nine touchdowns. Started, officially started six games, played 11 games, and also put up some pretty decent receiving numbers with 13 catches for 232 yards. That's 17.8 yards per catch for a running back. That is a very high number. I mean, that's as high as Malik Neighbors in terms of yards per catch, and this is a guy coming out of the backfield. Um, Roll at the next level, kind of tough to project. I think he's more of a complementary option. Definitely big play potential. He's got acceleration, burst, breakaway speed, and he's a skilled pass catcher, but he doesn't have great vision. I don't know if he would really thrive as an early down, every down workhorse back. Not that there are very many of those even left in the NFL. Um, And he also, another big drawback, I think, is he struggled with fumbles. He's got smaller hands and he fumbled, I think, can't remember the exact number, but it was like once in every 36 touches or something, which was the most out of this entire draft class of running backs in terms of fumble rate. So you'd like to see him protect the ball a little bit better. Justin, where do you think Marshawn Lloyd's going to be drafted? Well, I was feeling bold a few weeks ago. I'm not feeling as bold as I was then, but (laughs) uh, I I thought he had a better opportunity than most people realize to be the first running back drafted. Like I had heard some of that chatter around the senior bowl time that he was RB1 for a lot of teams. And, uh, and he didn't do anything there to really change their minds. Uh, I think he's dynamic. What he averaged like six, six and a half yards per carry this past season. No, like, I said it. Great... I just said it's seven, seven point one yards per carry seventh in all of FBS. 7.1. I mean, playing at USC, right. With Caleb Williams and that, uh, Lincoln Riley offense, really good player, dual threat. As you said, you know, can catch the ball coming out of the backfield a little on the smaller side, as you alluded to, but I think he's one of the first three running backs drafted. If he's not the first, I put him right up there with Trey Benson from Florida State and Jonathan Brooks from Texas, right? All three are different types. Brooks has the knee injury, as you know, so that, that'll that potentially muddies the waters there a little. Uh, but uh, I, I really like Marshall. I was surprised the Titans visited with him because I'm like, I don't think he's going to be too at like 106 <laughs> or so whenever they pick in the fourth round. And I mean, even taking a fourth round running back would surprise us, right? After the, the investments made in Tajay Spears, and uh, and Tony Pollard. So I think he's off the board before they even come on the clock at 106. So this visit uh, really struck me as a bit of a peculiar one. 
Yeah, maybe they were asking about wide receiver Brendan Rice or something. Who knows? <laughs> but uh, yeah, this one is weird to me. I I definitely would rather the Titans use their draft resources elsewhere. Like you said, they have a, a pretty great feature back that we expect to take on a much larger role in Tajay Spears. A really, really good compliment to him in Tony Pollard, who not a cheap last one time either. he was in... Not a cheap one. And the last time he was in a complimentary role, he was maybe the best RB2 in football. So project him back into that role here with the Titans. And then they brought Julius Chestnut back on his restricted free agent contract or whatever. Like he was a, he's a, been a preseason beast and pretty, I mean, he's been fine anytime he's gotten a chance. You could do a lot worse with your third running back. He can catch the ball too. Do they really need to go spend a draft pick on a running back when they have so many roster holes to fill and so much depth in the roster to fill out that I feel like, I think this visit is maybe, I don't know. It's a weird one to me. I don't know if it tells us anything. Like we said, sometimes visits mean something. Sometimes they don't. If they love the player, yeah, you know what I mean? They love the player. You keep your options open. There have been some chatter about them looking for a finisher at the a quote unquote finisher, like who's carrying the ball in the fourth quarter. I don't know that Marshawn Lloyd is that type of player. I don't think that's Marshawn Lloyd. Yeah. (laughs) Right. Like he's got, he's a bit, I mean, he's, he's well built, but he's short, right? He's a smaller back. Um, I, divi- you know, Brian Callahan's talked about division of labor at running back, not knowing what that looks like and how it's going to be fluid and changed throughout the season. So I'm not shocked they're keeping their options open at the position per se. Um, but I, I, I would be a little surprised if they spent, uh, you know, a fourth, even a fifth round pick on a run. You get to round six, seven, whatever, all bets are off. You love a running back, you take them. But, uh, yeah. but I, I, I'd be surprised if they took someone, you know, of the caliber of prospect that Marshawn Lloyd is. Yeah, I, I feel the same way. I mean, he he is a little bit similar to Chase Brown, the running back the Bengals drafted last year who played a complimentary role and made some big plays. But again, the, the Bengals didn't have Tony Pollard behind Joe Mixon. They had to draft somebody and whatever. All right, let's move on to our next player here on the list. The next top 30 that we heard about was wide receiver Roman Wilson, national champion out of Michigan. Uh, a little bit on the smaller side. He's only 5'11", 185, but he can survive at that weight in the NFL, especially if he plays primarily in the slot. I think he took over 60% of his slots or 60% of his snaps in the slot last year and like 30, 35% on the outside. Um, he has a crazy story. He told this story at the Senior Bowl for anyone who was following all that coverage, but this is a kid who grew up in Hawaii. He actually went to the same high school as Marcus Mariota and Tua Tagovailoa. In high school, he won 38 straight games, including four straight state championships. But the crazy part is he lived on a different island. He did not live in Honolulu. So he had to wake up every morning, take the bus to the airport, wait for a standby flight to fly to Honolulu so he could make it to high school. I actually, we we interviewed him for NFL on Fox podcast yesterday, actually. That's going to come out on Friday. So I'm interviewing him too later this week. There you go. I mean, he was he's a great guy, really, really down to earth, cool to talk to, humble, smart. I, I really like talking to him. And he told us the story about how his dad got a job at the airport with this airline just so that Roman could go try to get standby flights and fly for free to Honolulu every day. He did this every day for six weeks, flying an hour in the morning or about an hour in the morning to get to high school. Said he was late almost every day. Stayed after school for football practice, took the bus back to the airport, took a flight back to his island. I mean, this guy was dedicated to the sport. And then eventually he like started crashing with his teammates and families that had kids at his high school. And he would stay there during the week and only go home on the weekends. But for like six weeks, he was getting on a plane, two flights a day. Um, So just a hard worker dedicated to the sport. And you see where it got him. I mean, he ended up at Michigan. Like I said, won 38 straight games in high school. Got to Michigan in 2020. It was the COVID-shortened season. They went 2-4. and four. And then from there, over the next three years, his Michigan teams went 40-3 and three over the next three seasons, including an undefeated season last year, 15-0, and winners of the national championship. We literally asked him, we were like, what is it about Roman Wilson teams that just don't lose? And, uh, you know, he, he didn't want to take any credit for that. He, he attributed it to, like, team camaraderie and whatever. But he's been part of winning football programs going back to his freshman year of high school. Uh, he's a, He ran a 4-3-9 at the Combine. I think he's a willing run blocker, which you have to be if you play in that Michigan offense. Like, you're not going to get on the field as a receiver if you're not run blocking. 
and then didn't have a super productive year because, again, Michigan did not need to throw the ball very much, and they were often winning by 30-plus points in the fourth quarter. But he did lead Michigan with 48 catches this year, 789 receiving yards, and a high touchdown number, tied for ninth in the FBS with 12 receiving touchdowns. 12 touchdowns. Started on 48 catches. 12 touchdowns. On 48 catches. That's a ca- <laughs> that's a touchdown every four catches, if you're counting. Started all 15 games for the national champions and he was second team all Big Ten conference. He was a co-offensive skill player of the year for Michigan. He's got great ball skills. He dominated at the Senior Bowl. Justin, my question, is pick 38 too early for Roman Wilson? I personally think it's a little early. Uh, I wouldn't be shocked if he goes in that range. Chargers, if they pass on receiver at five, they're in that second round there. Uh, right, 37. Right before you got Harbaugh <laughs> co- coached them, so... Uh, I think it's a little early, though. I'll be honest. I think he, you know he's probably a slot only at the next level, in my opinion. And if he comes in, he's competing with maybe Traylon Burks and Kyle Phillips at that spot, which I've got no problem with. I think most Titans fans are ready to move on from both of those guys, and yeah. I'd be fine with that. So slot only, though, thirty-eight, little early. I'm not. You said everything I wanted to say, right? You went on about the the four three nine at the combine. He was uncoverable at the Senior Bowl knows how to quickly uncover man in zone coverage. I talked to him. I actually interviewed him in January as well, right before the senior bowl. Mm. I talked to him about that efficiency, like how 12 touchdowns on 48 catches. Like, what do you attribute that to? And he honestly just said getting better at scramble drill because I thought a lot of those was just the chemistry between JJ and I, when he would escape the pocket, like not a lot of them or not all of them were just designed plays. So really good, smart, dedicated football player, hard worker, great athlete, certainly checks a lot of boxes. He, he reminds me and scouts, pe- people have said this, of Tyler Lockett. I can kind of see that comparison. He's a guy that can win say, on the outside. I'm sorry. And I'll tell you off. I want to say I asked him for a player mm. comp, and he said Tyler Lockett when I interviewed him. There you go. So Pretty sure. Uh, and, you know, the, the the other drawback about Roman Wilson's game, I think, if you, if you watch him, is you'll notice he's not a great yak threat. He's not a yak beast. He's not going to break 10 tackles and turn a five-yard slant into a touchdown. But... Neither is Tyler Lockett. Tyler Lockett is like famous for not getting any yards after catch and just going down as soon as he catches the ball to avoid all contact. So um, I think he could, Roman Wilson could definitely be a productive player of your offense. He's not like a wide receiver one at the next level, but for a team that has DeAndre Hopkins in the final year of his contract at age 31 or 32, whatever Hopkins is, and Calvin Ridley on the other side, Roman Wilson fits really well into that offense. And then projecting for the future, he could be your slot Ridley could be your Z move guy and you just need to go get another dominant alpha X receiver. Those are so easy to come by (laughs) Um, when DeAndre Hopkins contract is up. So I would, I would be thrilled if the Titans find a way to move back from 38, pick up an extra day two pick and use one of those picks on Roman Wilson. He's one of my favorite players in this draft, just from an overall standpoint. Really good player. Really good player. All right, moving on now. We don't need to say too much about this next prospect. This is the next reported top 30 we heard was Notre Dame offensive tackle Joe Alt. The odds on betting favorite to be the Titans pick at number seven overall. I mean, what more can we say about Joe Alt? Go watch our film breakdown. We, we talked for 43 minutes about this prospect, talked about his background, his dad being a first round pick for the Chiefs, making it to two Pro Bowls in his time there. The, you know, Joe Alt was a team captain, finalist for the Outland Trophy, which goes to the nation's top offensive or defensive lineman, finalist for the Lombardi Award, which goes to the nation's top college offensive lineman or defensive lineman, first team All-American, 33 consecutive starts along the offensive line, and 32 of those 33 were at left tackle. He's only 21 years old. He will be 21 for the entire duration of his rookie season. He's a lock to be a top 10 pick. And if he's on the board when the Titans pick at number seven, even if Malik Neighbors is there, I think Justin, you and I are pretty much fully expecting him, if he makes it, to be the Titans' first round pick. Yeah, he's my choice at number seven. Uh, you, what can I say that I haven't already? Plug and play, left tackle, Pro Bowl, all pro potential. This visit makes a lot of sense. Uh, go watch the film breakdown. As you said, we covered him for like 45 minutes, broke down a whole game of film, strengths, weaknesses, all that good stuff. So, uh, Joe Alt's number seven makes a lot of sense. All right. Before we move on to the next player on our list, let me tell you about our sponsors, Sinkers Beverages in East Nashville and Bluegrass Beverages in Hendersonville. 
These are great local businesses that support the Titans community that you should be supporting them to help support the Titans community. Sinker's Beverages voted the best liquor store in Nashville two years in a row. Bluegrass Beverages has been serving the local community for over 50 years. And like I said in the intro, head to the Sinker's Beverages website or check the link in this podcast description and sign up for the in crowd to get special allocations, insider deals, exclusive events and barrel releases and more. And plus, you can find them on Uber Eats. Just search Sinker's on Uber Eats. Have all your booze delivered directly to your house. They have a huge selection of wines, bourbons. And if you make the trip out, they have a massive walk-in beer fridge. So shout out to Sinker's Beverages in East Nashville and Bluegrass Beverages in Hendersonville. All right, Justin, moving on down our list here, the seventh reported top 30 visit out of the 13 we know of. Running back Rasheen Ali out of Marshall. Interesting prospect here. This guy missed most of the 2023 season due to injury, um, but he did come back for the final three games of the year, rushed for 273 yards and one touchdown in those three games. Probably a late day three, if not UDFA prospect. You mentioned at the top that sometimes these teams will meet with guys that they plan to sign as UDFAs just so they know who they want to target after the draft is over. Probably a special teams guy and maybe an RB3 at the best, I think, at the next level. What do you say? I like him a bit more than you. I definitely got a draftable grade on him. Uh, I think open field speed is breathtaking at times on tape. Uh, The way he can just one of those one cut slashers, you know what I mean? Where he plants his foot cuts and can really take it the distance every single time. Uh, Again, similar type though, a bit smaller, not great in pass protection because of that. Uh, Not, you know, doesn't break a lot of tackles is another thing that concerned me on tape with him. But yeah. uh, dynamic, dynamic football player with the ball in his hands. I've got a day three grade on him. I imagine he does get drafted. The injury muddies things a bit. I think he didn't really participate at the Senior Bowl because of that, but he was invited. Mm-hmm. Uh, but we're talking about a, a, a potentially dynamic running back that can be had on day three. Yeah, I agree. Day three or late day three or UDFA. We'll see. Um, but yeah, an- another instance where I'm like, the Titans, just if you're going to get a running, running back, back out again. of this draft class... Do it on the UDFA market. Don't spend the draft pick on, on this position. But hey, Rand Carthon played running backs. So maybe he just wants to draft one or two every year. Uh, moving on <laughs> to the do next every player. year in San Fran too, didn't he? Pretty much. Exactly. Moving on to the next player on our list. We're looking at cornerback Kalen Carson out of Wake Forest. Carson led Wake Forest with eight pass breakups last year, started 11 games, had 42 tackles, one tackle for loss, a forced fumble. Uh, during his four-year college career, he broke up 26 passes picked off three passes, um, and he's another guy that is in this physical press cover Denard Wilson mold. He's a versatile corner who played outside and inside at Wake Forest, and another guy who's probably not coming off the board until day three. So another one in the same mold of the Chris Abrams drain, the Jarvis Brownlee Jr. The only difference is he doesn't have three names. He doesn't have a junior or a hyphen. He just has two names. But it's a cool name, Kalen Carson. <laughs> a bit bigger than those guys, too, if my memory serves me correctly. About six foot, 200 pounds. I think he's likelier to be a boundary guy, right? So that shows you that sort of the difference. Uh, but again, I think same Mulder is he's very physical and scrappy. Now, I wish he turned some of those PBUs into more interceptions. You know, I think he was great at breaking up the ball, not as good at coming down with it. So I'd like to see that change at the next level. But he's extremely competitive. He's sticky in coverage. He's physical. He wants to jam receivers at the line of scrimmage. Uh, definitely fits the Denard Wilson profile, in my opinion. Yeah, I agree. And I think, you know, the Titans will be well served, whereas I don't think they would be well served to draft a running back on day three. I think they would be well served to draft one, if not two, cornerbacks on day three and, and really fill out the depth of that position and plan ahead for the future and for injuries. All right, two guys on our list next up that we have talked about in depth on this YouTube channel. The next one is Malik Neighbors, wide receiver out of LSU, who they also met with at the Combine. They also had a private meeting with uh, ahead of Malik Neighbors' pro day. But again, what more can we say about this guy? Go watch our film breakdown. This was our longest one, Justin. I think it was like an hour and three minute film breakdown on Neighbors, talking about his background, his strengths, why he's going to be an electric playmaker in the league, and why he's so good he's probably not going to be on the board when the Titans are picking at number seven overall. But in case Alt is gone and Neighbors is there, they want to do their due diligence with him. He had 89 catches, 1,569 receiving yards, and 14 touchdowns last year. Going to likely be a top 10 pick. But the one thing, Justin, I do want to spend a little bit of time talking about with Neighbors 
is this recent report from Tony Pauline that a lot of teams see neighbors as a high maintenance prospect. Now, how do you feel about this report? Is this Rand Carthon trying to push neighbors down the board to number seven and putting some some info out there that may affect him negatively in terms of his draft stock? Or is this a case of like, this is a wide receiver and he's got a little bit of that diva wide receiver attitude. He recently said, talking to somebody about the Giants picking him, that if the Giants pick him, they got to get their quarterback situation sorted out because he said, they're going to want to get me the ball. (laughs) So I definitely think he's got a little bit of that wide receiver attitude but I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. I like my wide receivers to be a little diva-ish. You don't want to get too crazy with it because then they go demand to trade on you and throw fits on the sidelines and you know punch kicking nets and yell at your quarterback and whatever Odell Beckham and Stephon Diggs and other guys like that have done recently, A.J. Brown. But I think it's good to have a little bit of that fire, so I'm curious where you come down on that. Well, like you said, it. I don't think he'd be the first receiver to have this type of attitude. A lot, most of them do that are good, right? It's just the nature of the beast. I haven't heard anything regarding red flags, off-field stuff. I think you might be able to draw some conclusions from some of what you've heard, but uh, I, I haven't heard anything to the point where you'd remove him from your draft board or not consider oh, no. him at number seven. I mean, you don't love some of this stuff, I think that, but it comes with the territory, okay? NFL teams... They put up with headaches all the time if you're a good football player. It's just reality. You think A.J. Brown didn't cause headaches here in Tennessee and now in Philadelphia too, and Randy Moss, Terrell Owen, synonymous with that stuff, right? So it's just sometimes it feels like it comes with like Stephon Diggs just got his ass traded out of Buffalo because they were so fed up with some of the bullshit. So um, it comes with – it's nature of the beast, comes with a position sometimes. Um, really good football player though. Go watch the film breakdown an hour, like you said. Certainly should be on the Titans short list uh, at number seven overall. Absolutely. All right. Next guy on the list. We also did a film breakdown on Alabama offensive tackle JC Latham. Again, I feel like we've said it all. We did a 40 minute breakdown on him. It's up on the channel. So go check that out. Like we said in that video, he's extremely powerful. But I think the big drawback here is that he played exclusively on the right side at Bama and it projects to be a right tackle at the NFL. Pick number seven is very high to take a right tackle when you don't have a left tackle and when there might might be better options or better players suited to play on the left side, still on the board when you pick there. So if the Titans were to pick J.C. Latham, and we've heard from Teron Davenport via Jared Stillman's show that the Titans are very high on Latham, if they were to pick him, I think that would be likely in a trade back scenario, maybe to pick 13, maybe even to pick 16, 17, 18, as far back as you know the, the high teens. Maybe even the, the early 20s, I think, is where Latham could eventually come off the board. So, um, yeah, go watch the film breakdown that we did on him already. But Latham likely a trade back option in the first round. I would think so as well. We've talked about the positional value of left tackle versus right tackle, especially here in Tennessee, where left tackle has been such a sore spot for them in recent years. Uh, but uh, yeah, go watch the film breakdown. Good prospect. Love his strength, raw, sheer power. Uh, interesting guy. And I think the Titans are doing their due diligence here because if they are able to orchestrate a trade down, they don't want to just have, you know, met with the, their guys that are in pick seven range. They want to know what else they would be able to, like, they want to know these prospects that they might be drafting in a trade back scenario. So another tackle on this list, I think you're about to get to, uh, we are, he will be last. We will get to him in a moment. Um, we got two prospects between him and now the next report that we heard about another Michigan player this time on the defensive side of the ball, linebacker Junior Colson, who won the Lot Impact Award for all of college football last year, named after Ronnie Lot. Impact stands for Integrity, Maturity, Performance, Academics, Community, Tenacity. So a very high character guy. He was also second team all Big Ten last year, and he led Michigan with 95 tackles, started all 15 games, two tackles for loss, two pass breakups. And this guy is another guy with a crazy story. So Junior Colson spent the first nine years of his life living in Haiti. He entered an orphanage after his father passed away and in 2012 was adopted by the Colsons, who was a family that was spending time in Haiti after the devastating 2010 earthquake, helping rebuild. And they found this guy and they adopted him um, and brought him to America. And now look at him. He's an NFL draft prospect. I mean, what a crazy life this guy has lived. Um, But in terms of a player... I think a good blend of speed and explosiveness. He could. He doesn't have the best sideline to sideline speed, but he's fast enough. I think he's a, a three down backer. In fact, I think 
He's probably better in coverage than he is in the run game. I think he doesn't have the best instincts when it comes to fitting the run gaps. But in terms of coverage, he's got the athleticism to drop deep into that Tampa 2 shell. He's got the ability to stay with linebackers running across the field. Um, I think, in fact, like just looking at him as a prospect, fitting with the Titans, I think it'd be a good fit next to a guy like Kenneth Murray, who struggles in coverage but is great at getting downhill. So... Um, I don't know where he's going to come off the board. Maybe fourth round, maybe fifth round. What do you think about... We've talked about some linebackers. What, earlier? I think you're way off on that. Yeah, I think earlier. I think second or third round. Oh, wow. Okay, so is he in play for the Titans at 38 then? I mean, that seems early to me, but... Wouldn't stun me. I'll just say that. Wouldn't stun me. I, I You know, I, I think they've made it pretty clear they plan on drafting a linebacker in this class. I think there's a, a, a half-decent chance he's the first linebacker off the board. I mean, I think yeah. I'd put my money on Ed and Cooper from Texas A&M. I think he's probably the second linebacker off the board, this guy. Ahead of Peyton Wilson. Uh, by the way, uh, Mike Herndon, our pal, mentioned on Twitter a good point. Probably doesn't count as a top 30 visit because of the local connection. He's from Brentwood, Tennessee, and went to high school in Brentwood, Tennessee at Ravenwood. So good chance he doesn't count towards the 30 allocation. Um, It'll read depend. Into that what you will. It'll depend if it was the Titans provided transportation or not. If they don't right. provide transportation, it's a local visit. If they do provide transportation, it's a top 30 visit. So. Right, right, for sure. So we don't know which one it is. I mean, you'd like to think they probably want to get him in there without counting towards their 30 so they could bring in another 30. would make sense, but you never know. Good football player, uh, sideline to sideline. He's rangy, he's smart, he's productive, he's athletic. We know they want to take a linebacker. They've made that pretty clear. I, I don't love taking that position at 38, you know, a non-premium position, but uh, it's not about me, right? I, I wouldn't be shocked if that's what they do, is all I'm saying. And, and, and I they think need this guy linebackers. They need bodies. So even if you're taking one at 38 and another one in the fifth or sixth round, like that could be an yeah. option in this draft. You said you think he's going to be the second linebacker taken. You think he goes ahead of Peyton Wilson? I just got questions on the medicals, and I, yeah. I think teams do too. So that's the big thing for me is the medical. So I think I, I wouldn't be surprised. I've been doing this long enough where we've seen those medicals slide sometimes, right? So I think uh, it's probably a bit of a cleaner evaluation for teams. So it wouldn't surprise me if he goes before him. Wow. All right. The next guy we're going to talk about was at, at one point in time projected as a second round pick. We'll see if some off the field issues push him down the board. But the 12th out of 13 prospect visits we are talking about here is defensive tackle to Vondre Sweat, my big hook'em boy who won the Outland Trophy. I talked about how Joe Alt was a finalist for the Outland Trophy, which goes to the, the top offensive or defensive lineman he won Tavondre Sweat won beat Joe Alt for the Outland Trophy the nation's top lineman he was first team all-american big 12 defensive player of the year first team all big 12 I mean every accolade and award that you can win as a defensive lineman he won it played in all 14 games for Texas last year 45 tackles eight tackles for loss two sacks for everyone who says he's only a two down player four pass breakups which you know, is not in coverage, but knockdowns at the line of scrimmage, batted balls, basically. And he even blocked a kick for Texas last year. Um, you know, a lot of people are, are counting him as a two-down player. He's a massive, massive human being, space eater, nose tackle type. The Titans could definitely use a body like that in the middle of their defense. But I think he has some ability to rush the passer on third down as well. So I don't think he's just a two-down player. There are obvious, obvious off-field concerns as he was very recently arrested for a DWI. I think just a couple days before he flew in to visit the Titans in Nashville, he was arrested for a DWI, got out on a $3,000 bond so that he could continue his pre-draft visit cycle. He's got another meeting lined up after he leaves Nashville. I am a huge fan of the player, Tavondre Sweat. I am in agreement with most draft Knicks who say that Byron Murphy... While he was less productive for Texas than Sweat, is projects as a better pro. However, I don't think the difference is as big as many people in the scouting community make it out to be. I mean, Tavondre Sweat was the best player on a very good Texas defense last season. I think he fits a, a massive need for the Titans in terms of having a space-eating nose tackle who has some ability, at least on early downs, to get after the quarterback. I don't know. I... 38 seems very rich for this prospect, especially with the recent arrest. But if he, if this causes him to slide to, say, the fourth round, I think the Titans should pounce on that at, in, in, in that position. I don't know. Yeah, I'd like it in the fourth round if you're comfortable with the off-field stuff. I just, you know, 
even before that, people talking about early second round pick. I, 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 how many 360 pound D linemen are great pass rushers in the NFL? Like I, I just, he's not going to be a great pass rusher in the NFL. He might be an okay pass rusher. He'd probably be a, a pretty damn good run stopper and a nose tackle. Well, yeah. Then you start talking about positional value. Can you get those guys later? Where did you find tier tart, right? He's not the only example. There's a lot of them. Nose tackles in the league that they're not that valuable. So they go late. They don't get paid a lot of money. What did tier tart just get from the Texans, right? Or the dolphins, wherever he ended up. So it's like, uh, even before the arrest, I had questions about position of life. You think the Phil- here's a good example for you. You think the Philadelphia Eagles would take a do over on the Jordan Davis pick if they could? I think they would. Well, I don't know if they would because they picked the same position, uh, same player from the same position from the same school the next year. <laughs> well, Carter had significantly more pass rushing upside, in my opinion, than, than Davis did coming out. So uh, that's a good example, though, of like almost a buyer beware or buyer's remorse type of thing where it's like when you take those guys that aren't great pass rushers early and yes, there's a difference between 12 and 38, but 38 is still high enough where I think you'd, a couple of years from now, I bet you'd have some questions about it. I, that is true. But at the same time, you look at the recent list of defensive tackles who have gotten absolutely paid in free agency and almost all of them were drafted in the first two rounds, like 80% of them drafted in the first two rounds. All of them are great pass rushers. Jeffrey Simmons yes. is a great pass rusher. Uh, Quinnen Williams is a great pass rusher. They can all rush the passer. I'm not This guy's going to have 10 sacks a year at the next I'm level. I'm not saying he's going to have 10 sacks pounds. a year, I don't but think I, so. I don't think 10 sacks a year is in the cards, but I think he's, I think on most third downs, he probably comes off the field. I think there are instances he could play on third down. I think he can rush the passer, rush the passer in like play action situations on second down, early down yeah, passing, agree. which is becoming more and more frequent in the NFL. And and the Titans need, if you got Kenneth Murray playing linebacker, you need a big ass body you on do. the defensive line to eat up some blocks and give Look, Murray some free lanes to get in the backfield. They trade back. You get him in the early, mid, late 60s, 70s, slides all the way to 104 or whatever, 106 because of the arrest. Then uh, I'm intrigued. But at 38 for me, it'd be a pass. Yeah, I, I can get on board with that. I, I do think 38's early, especially with the arrest. So he's going to have some questions to answer when he meets or when he met with the Titans. I'm sure he had plenty of questions to answer. All right, one more guy, Justin, then we can end this episode. Offensive tackle Tyler Guyton out of Oklahoma. Started his college career at TCU, transferred to OU. He was an honorable mention for All Big 12 last season. Started nine games at right tackle, played in 10 games. He did miss a few due to injury. This is a guy who is pretty raw, inexperienced, but he's athletic. He's long. I think he could probably flip and play on the left side or the right side, depending on, you know, the team that drafts him where they have the biggest need. Doesn't have a ton of experience, you know, as a right tackle to the point where you'd, he'd have to relearn, so to say, how to play on the left side. And actually, in 2022, he did start one game at left tackle. Projected, what, mid-20s, late-20s, early second-round pick? Where do you see this guy coming off the board? Is he, I, I guess my question is, is this a trade down from seven, picking in the mid-teens pick? Or is this a hope he falls to 38 and draft him there kind of pick? It's hard for me because I think he's got a chance to be a first round pick, like a mid to late first. Uh, it's because the upside is so high with him. I, like, can I just say he reminds me of an OU tackle that was drafted in the first round by the Jacksonville Jaguars last year in Anton, Anton Harrison. Harrison. Yeah, I can see that, and I think there's a chance he's drafted earlier than him. That that's why it's you know if he doesn't go in the first, then yeah, he's probably there at 38. Right? It's one of those situations for me. Uh, you know, he reminds me of in this class, and I, I'm, I'm just going to say it. I don't love doing it, but is the, the kid from Georgia, Amarius Mims, because yeah. I think both of them are athletic freaks, and they haven't reached their performance ceiling because they're a little raw in the technical aspects of the game. But he's a really good player. One thing that makes him different uh, for, for me compared to some of the other guys that played right tackle is I think he can play left tackle. So that's what makes him. And, and look, Titans are doing homework, I think, on tackles if they trade down. No, no coincidence. I don't think that JC Latham and Tyler Guyton are both on this list where right. again, where this kid's different from Latham and even like a, a Talese Fuaga. I see those guys as right tackles through and through. I think this kid could play left tackle. In fact, you, I, he start. he's got like one career start at left tackle. It's one, but um, because of the movement skills, the athleticism, I think he could play either side of the line. So that makes him intriguing to me, especially if they trade back into that 15 to 20 range, it, it wouldn't totally shock me if he was the target there. 
Yeah, I, I, I agree. I think, you know, high upside guy, definitely going to need developing, but that's exactly the type of prospect you want in Bill Callahan's hands. You know, the guy with the high upside that you can mold into a good player, not the guy that doesn't have any traits that you just have to coach up from nothing, which has been, you know, I think overblown how much Bill Callahan can do for offensive linemen. Mike, you mentioned Mike earlier, tweeted it out recently, a list of all the all pro and pro bowl tackles that Bill Callahan has coached. And the majority of them were picked in the first or second round of the draft. So it's not like he's coaching up seventh rounders and UDFAs. So I agree. I think, you know, get a guy like that in with Bill Callahan and let him mold him into a good player. Same kind of like high ceiling as some of these other top tackles we're talking about, but potentially a much lower floor given the the lack of experience you just haven't seen it all there with him all right justin that does it 13 known top 30 visits for the titans went through all of them and again we've done film breakdowns on three of these guys so check out the channel if you missed the joe alt malik neighbors or jc latham film breakdown those are posted now so go check them out um, and that'll do it for this one. Thank you to everyone for listening. Thanks you, thank you even more to those of you watching on YouTube. If you are watching and you like this video, be sure to hit that thumbs up button, subscribe to the channel, turn on channel notifications so you get an alert every time we drop a new video. And uh, that will do it. Justin, uh, any last words? We got one more. You want to throw one in? At the end here, it just broke. <laughs> uh, HCU football edge, Jalex Hunt visits Titans. Let's do it. What do you know about him? <laughs> Played at the Senior Bowl. Really good player. I mean, you're talking about real small school, right? Houston Christian. And they wanted to see him at the Senior Bowl. He is athletic. He is twitchy. Uh, he's dynamic as a pass rusher. I'm very, very intrigued by this player. He's one of the smaller school guys at the Senior Bowl. Didn't look out of place by any stretch of the imagination. A uh, bit undersized, but really, really uh, interesting football player. Hey, there you go. Look at that 14 top 30 visits that we got to cover on this episode. Good timing on that if we had finished 10 minutes sooner, like we'd planned to instead of going as long as we did. <laughs> 52 minutes right now on this recording um anyway all right that'll do it thanks to everyone for tuning in and uh thanks to our sponsor sinkers beverages in east nashville and bluegrass beverages in hendersonville remember to check out sinkersbeverages.com and join the in crowd all right we'll be back later this week building out a top 10 big board for the titans that will be our next podcast coming soon so stay tuned to the feed for that until then y'all stay safe out there and tighten up A Broadway Sports Media Production.